Yep. Uh, this for this fourth day of the workshop for this introduction to reinforcement learning class. Um, it's designed to be, like it says, a friendly test tasting of, of reinforcement learning. It's a one hour class. Um, so in one hour, we cannot, you know, make of you like experts of all of reinforcement learning, but I try to choose what I think is important. Um, and, you know, for that, I also, you know, took inspiration from great material that exists out there online, which I will, you know, give you, give you the references to. And um, essentially, the class is going to cover some basics about Markov decision processes, which are really at the heart of what reinforcement learning is about, and some initial ideas of how we can build algorithms to learn by trial and error, to learn by making decisions and getting feedback from the environment and then progressively improve our strategies. So this is really what reinforcement learning is about. I have heard from, pre from colleagues that like many of you are already know about reinforcement learning. So just a show of hands, how many people here know already about reinforcement learning? Okay, cool. So I think for most of you that raised your hands, a lot of this material is actually quite I mean, maybe familiar. Um, I, I, I kind of, I, I would hope that at least some of it is like, because there, there's not gonna be anything about deep reinforcement learning in here. So it's really going to be the, the basics of how reinforcement learning kind of um, is at the, at, the, at, the, at the heart of it. And then um, in the second part, so after a little break, we'll see how well that works. It's the first time I do this. So after a little break quiz, We'll move to like explaining the key algorithms, maybe like Q learning and, and policy gradients that are maybe the things that are still and being developed and uh, and topics of, of open open research. Okay, so I mean Francesco already said quite a lot about me. Um, so I you know I skip the first part. Okay, I worked for you know, after my PhD. I worked for Amazon and then I worked for DeepMind for four years. And I work on, you know, all sorts of things, reinforcement learning theory. And um, recently I moved to the University of Tübingen where I'm now le leading a group. And recently I've been awarded an ERC starting grant. So I'll be growing my group um, in the next few years. So, you know, if you're interested in topics like reinforcement learning theory, bandit algorithms, uncertainty quantification, exploration, non-stationary environment and continual learning. This is more or less what my group is about. And if some of these words are not clear for now, I hope that they will be by the end of this class. All right, so most of the slides and the content here has been heavily inspired by really high quality material that's online, in particular the video lectures by David Silver from like his UCL lectures that are already about 10 years old, but I think still completely relevant. Um, and you know, these lectures are based on like important books and some online, like I also like I took inspiration for some online courses and tutorial that I, I think, I think were, were worth mentioning. There are more of these things out there. Um, um, just the, these are the, the references I, I, I felt like were the most relevant for this course. Okay, with these kind of preliminaries, let's get started. So um, machine learning is not just about computer vision. There's also a lot of problems out there that are actually dynamical systems, just fundamentally dynamical systems. If you, if you interact with them, they will, they will change. They will change states. They will be modified by your action, and you will have to cope with a system that, ref that responds to you. And this is a little bit like what to some extent is, is missing in the traditional view of reinforcement learning, where you, know, you have a problem that is fixed and you need to collect data to estimate what is the right function to you know, map um, like the data to like, the output, something like this. Here really, be it in, in the problem of Go or in cooling data centers, when you make a decision in this system, you impact it long term. And so you need to take this into account so that your actions kind of reflect what you want to do in the long term. And to model this situation, for a while now already, maybe since the 90s roughly, reinforcement learning has converged on studying what we call Markov decision processes. And these are very specific, very 
finicky mathematical objects. That's why I'm going to spend quite a bit of time at the beginning of this talk to explain to you like how these things work and how we can work with them and how we can actually compute things in these objects that are not you know, your usual RD kind of uh, a space. Okay, so in these systems, we assume that the system is in, at every round, at every step T in this learning process, the system is in a state that we denote usually S. And in this system, I take an action A. And following this action, sometimes I observe a reward that depends on the state and the action. But most of the time, well, the only thing I only observe is a transition to a next state. And the goal is to, you know, um, take all these past states, like take, all, take the state at state at round T and construct what we call a policy that is going to go and map um, like the state to the action. Okay, so um, it's, uh, these are just the notation that I just introduced. Uh, just for, you know, to, to build a model out of this kind of general, general idea, um, we have a Markov, like we, it's, it's a Markov process, so everything, you know, all the information about the past is in, encoded in the state. That's the key assumption in reinforcement learning. We assume that we don't actually need memory because everything that we see at, at time t is, is encoded in the state that we observe. It's a strong assumption that is most of the time non, not valid in real systems. But for now, just to, for the sake of building algorithms, we're gonna assume that this is, that this is true. And we, we're, here in this class, we're going to always assume that there's a finite set of states and a finite set of actions. I think I say a little bit at some point about like infinite set of states, but like, you know, essentially you can think of it as like a finite set of states, finite set of actions, and like small systems where you can move step after step after step into this, this small system. Okay, so what we want is um, to construct a policy. So this thing at the, at the very bottom here. So this policy is a function that is going to map states to actions. And what we want to do is find a policy that has a large long-term return. And this long-term aspect of this definition is captured by this discount factor, which is a very important quantity in all the settings that we're going to look at. We always assume that the agent has kind of a, has a, gives a value to how far in the future it looks. And here, so how is this quantified? The, the return is defined as the expectation. So there's always noise in all those processes because all the transitions or the rewards are a little bit noisy. So here we, we kind of take the expectation over all of this. Um, and we look at from the state, from the initial state where the agent started, we look at the sum of rewards that it got from step zero from now taking actions all the way to like infinity. So we assume this trajectory is like an infinite sequence of state, action, state, actions, and we look at the sum of the rewards. And as you can see, essentially, after roughly a horizon of one over one minus gamma-ish, so like when, when t is like 10, if gamma is something smaller than one, already, you know, the reward that you get here is, is really like drastically like down weight. So, this kind of returns really gives you um, an incentive to go and construct policies that have an incentive to go straight to the goal. Okay. And not they just turn around and wait and maybe in the future reach the, the place with the rewards. So it's, it's, it, in, it incentivizes being, being uh, efficient. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure what I changed here. Okay. <clears throat> And um, so, um, yeah, so the, the big question that we are going to look at in the next, whatever, five minutes or something is how can we actually optimize in an MDP when we know the model? So we're not yet solving a learning problem because the learning problem is really hard. But first, in, in the first place, like if, you, if I give you an MDP, and I tell you what is the matrix for transitions, and I tell you what is the reward function, how do you compute this policy that maximizes this, maximizes this expected return? In general, it's actually not that easy. So since a lot of you already know about reinforcement learning, you probably already know a little bit about how 
um, how we do this. But so in general, um, the question is, um, yeah, how do we construct, construct these policies? Okay, so as a first step, we're going to practice a little bit like this definition of this, uh, this uh, value, right? The, the, the expected return that I just, that's just defined that we also call the value of the policy. So we, here I show you a great world MDP. So this is a typical MDP, right? We have a finite, set of, a finite set of states, finite set of actions in each of the states. We can go up, left, right, and, and, south, and, and, and south, and down. And um, so the policy is defined by this like blue arrows. So I give you a policy for now, and I just ask to compute the value of this policy, like this expected return. There is no reward in every state, and there's only reward when you reach this thing. So here we see that the policy is going to do right, right, up, up, right. So it's going to take one, I mean, one, two, three, four, no, one, two, three, four, five steps to reach the goal. And so when we compute the value, we have to compute like the sum of like all these zero rewards that are discounted. And eventually, the reward that, that the, the policy obtains is just the, this like kind of discounted thing. If the policy would be, for any reason, doing like this, 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 and eventually going here, the reward that it would obtain would be much, much lower. So we really want to design policies that you know, kind of uh, go straight as straight as possible to the goal. So that seems like a reasonable, a reasonable goal. That's why I'm showing this. It's like the problem is well posed. Now, how to, how to solve it is not, is not, an, like, is not easy. So, um, yeah, so like we said, like the value, the value function is, is defined like this. And we, we are going to use kind of an, uh, an, intermediate, an intermediate tool. Um, this intermediate tool that is going to be crucial for the entire class is what we call the state action value function or the Q function. This Q function gives you for every state and action, it gives you the, the value of like the, what you get now plus what you will get in the future if you follow this policy from now on. So you're here, sorry. you're typically like you're, you're here in this policy, you get zero reward and then gamma times this, this, the reward that you get from this state. If you're here, you get zero reward plus gamma times what you get in this state. But obviously what you get in this state, we, we just said it's like zero reward plus, plus the value of the state. So you, you see that there is kind of this kind of um, cascading effect, that like the value propagates along the trajectories, along the, the states, from more or less from the goal to, to where you started. And the idea that we are going, that like Bellman developed is this idea of relying on this um, on this recursive, the recursive aspect of, of Markov decision processes to define an optimality condition that we call the, the Bellman optimality equations. So Bellman proved um, that the Q function, the optimal Q function, meaning the Q function of the optimal policy, satisfies this equality, meaning that the, the optimal Q function in every state is just the reward that you get now plus gamma times the expectation of the reward that you will get in the future by just like unrolling this optimal policy from, from there on. And what this gives us is simply a, a natural way of computing the, like, the, the optimal value function by exploiting these recursive equations inside the MDP. So we are going to compute values and then apply the Bellman equation to update the values in every state so that we can progressively converge to the optimal value function. And then that will give us, give us a policy because once you have the Q function, the optimal Q function, if you're in a state S, the optimal action is the one that maximizes this Q because this is the one here that maximizes the Q here. So if you follow the Q function, it's your, it's your guide through the MDP. So basically solving this, 
this Q function problem, like maximizing the Q function, finding the Q function that maximizes the value in the MDP, directly gives you access to the policy. So there are two algorithms to do this. This is kind of recursive. There are two different ways of uh, tackling this, this problem. The first one is called value iteration. So it's really this idea that, we, that I just described, a bit like, you know, with my hands. So we're going to leverage the Bellman equation. So initially, we are going to put something to the values of the states. Let's say, for example, we, we choose like all the values of all the states are zero. And then we loop over the states. And for all the states, we compute what is the maximum over the actions of reward plus gamma times the expectation of the value at the next state when you take this action. So this, this, this maximum here is over the entire thing, right? The action is also here. So what you can do is just, in practice, you compute the Q function. So the Q function is for each action is exactly this value, right? You compute the Q function for each of the, the action that, you, that are available in this state. And then you take the maximum of the Q function and you give it to the value here. Right. So it's, it's, a fairly, it's, it's easy. And why can we do this? Because we know the reward. We are still in this like, non-learning problem. We are just optimizing. We have rewards. We have the probability of transition. So we can compute all these quantities. It's just iterating over them. And we know that by the Bellman optimality equations, we know that this converges to the true Q value function, to the true right value function. So these this Q functions that you will compute eventually after a few iterations are Q star or close to Q star, and they will give you the optimal policy. So that's one way of doing this, of applying Bellman equations. The other way of doing it is directly to look at the policy. To say, OK, let's start with a policy, whatever it is. Maybe it's just a random policy that goes like 1 half, 1 half, or you know, that goes like 1 over K in each action. OK, and then we compute the value of this policy in each state action pair. So because we can, again, we can do this. We have access to the reward. We have access to the P. We have access to everything. So it's very easy. We just, for each state and action, we look at our policy and we compute what would be its return, starting from there, taking this action. And then we update the policy. So we do a policy improvement step where we take this policy and we say, now in every state, you're going to take the action that maximizes the Q value. And so now this policy is just a little bit better, a little bit more satisfying the Bellman equation. And we can reloop again. And we can compute the Q function again from this policy and again update the policy. And that, after a few iterations, directly converges to the, to the optimal policy and for the optimal value function. So, there's something like really efficient, really like kind of natural in this uh, in, in in these MDPs that that really relies on on the on this Markov assumption that we, that we made at the beginning, that all dynamic programming works. Dynamic programming is is this this uh, this term that we use to um, like say that we can reuse uh, reuse data that was already computed in this this graph or this this MDP in in uh, in, in this case, and just update recursively. So it's a very efficient computation. So does this all make sense? Yes. I'm going to make a, so I have a little like kind of exercise that we're going to do together. Um, so I drew perhaps the simplest MDP I could think of. Um, so this is an, the deterministic MDP. Um, typically, I'm going to put you at the beginning in the state one or in the state two, let's say. Let's say in the state two. And you can do right or left. If you do right, you transition to the right state. If you do left to the left state with probability one. So it's a deterministic MDP. On the left side, there is a reward of one. And on the right side, there's a reward of five. So already you kind of quickly intuit that, you know, the optimal policy is when you're in state two is just to transition to state three. And if you're in state three, you stay there. You continue looping and you collect this five reward every time. And if you're here, well, what do you do? Do 
Do you stay here or do you go to the right? Yeah, I heard it over there. It depends on gamma. So to know whether you stay here, whether you collect this small reward or you're gonna move all the way here, you need to compute the value function for this particular state here. You actually need to do it here, but it's super trivial, right? Like first iteration, you're gonna immediately see that like this, this, this state is, has a larger value all the time than, than this one. But like for this state on the left, it's gonna depend on gamma and we want to find what is the condition on gamma for this to work. Okay, so this is the Bellman equation. And so we start, so I wrote down like kind of drafty, I wrote down the, initially I kind of thought I would be doing on the board for you, but like eventually, I think it's actually faster and you all get the intuition anyway. So, uh, okay, we are here, we compute the value function for, you know, at the first iteration, at the beginning everybody has zero, right? So the value function of state one and making a left is reward one plus gamma times the current value, which is zero, so it's just one then the value of one and the state one and making right, well, it's zero plus zero, so zero. And we do that for all of them, so V2 is zero everywhere because everybody has a zero for now, and V3, well, it's five or it's zero. Okay, so the value function is now five because we take the maximum again. So now we've updated this value function to one on the left, five on the right, and zero in the middle. And now, second iteration of value iteration. Now, for the left state, um, we're going to have to count plus one when we get the reward, but gamma times the current value of the left state, which is one. So how we have one plus gamma, okay? And on the right side, same. We have five plus five times gamma, right? Because we discount the current value. And this one in the middle gets well, it gets the value of this guy because it's zero plus the value of this guy or zero plus the value of this guy. But five, time, five plus five gamma is always larger than one plus one gamma. So this is the value of this state now. And that gives us a condition. Long term, so like at the next round, basically when we ask what is the value here, we are going to compute the value of this state when you do left, which is this kind of discounted, you know, adding one reward here, versus making right and get discounting twice what is here. So this is kind of what happening, gamma times the gamma that is here. And so we get an inequation here, and at this round already we need to decide what, for what, you know, for my value of gamma, what is the maximum? What is the action that is the maximum? Should I go right or should I go left? Maybe, you know, the only gamma that verifies this, maybe there's no solution to this equation, and so like for now, maybe you need to stay left. But as we continue iterating, we will always have to ask ourselves like what are the value of gammas for which the optimal policy is to go right. Okay, this was like to make it a little bit more concrete that in general, value iteration is gives you this answer to, in every state, do you want to plan ahead? Do you want to collect long-term rewards? Or do you want to be greedy and collect the local rewards? And this, this plays a crucial role in like literally like all, all of reinforcement learning. It also you know, kind of quantifies how, how kind of risk averse you are. Like as soon as you introduce some sort of non-deterministic things, like okay, maybe it's actually risky, I mean, not risky, but it's like, you don't, con you don't transition to the right every time. Maybe sometime you stay here. Ah, you need to take this into account. Because if transitioning here is only probability one half, then it, it affects your, your the Bellman equation. And so now the value of gamma that you need to really value this state is actually really, really high. You need to be able to like plan ahead many, many moves and not just two moves. Okay. And that also show you, shows you the, the very important role of the discount factor in this problem. Discount factor is a property of the agent. It's not given by, I mean, you can think it's given by the environment, but intrinsically it's really you as a, as a designer of an, of an RL algorithm that is gonna say, I want an agent that looks into the future or, or not. And like this, this affects the optimal, the optimal solution in your MDP. 
Okay, problem. In reinforcement learning, in general, we don't know the model. We don't know R, we don't know P, so there's no way we can compute the, the value iteration like exact um, updates. So we are gonna have to deal with this. So the question one is how can we evaluate the policy if we don't know the reward function and we don't know the transition probabilities? And the question two is, okay, once we have a policy and we can roughly evaluate it, maybe with some stochastic you know, estimates, how can we improve it? How do I have a gradient? You know, how do, how do I take into account this feedback and try to maybe try a different action? You know, if my policy was going this way, like what do I know about the value of a policy that would go this way? This is, this is like the problem of, in reinforcement learning is that there is only the data you have. There's only the data you collected. Your data set is not a given. Your data set is, is something that you work for and you need to take actions for. And that's, where we're gonna, that's what we're gonna try to see now in, in like more, more or less like the entire rest of this class. Are there questions on like this whole value iteration and you know, the definition of, of the goal in, in, in reinforcement learning and in markup decision processes? Is gamma fixed for all the steps? Um, is that, you, do you have, no, that, did I repeat all the question? Yeah, that was, was the question basically. Uh, okay, is gamma fixed for all the steps? So yes, gamma is fixed for, for all the steps. Um, in general, you know, it's like, how can I say this? It's almost like you're defining a loss function here with this gamma, right? Um, yes. So this, this, is a, this is imposed by the environment, the R, and all the transition that result from this state and this action are imposed by the environment. So somehow, this gamma kind of parameterizes your goal. It's your loss function, it's your, it's your I mean, in, in, a, in RL we talk about rewards, right? So like we really always optimize for sums of rewards, but really like intrinsically your gamma is what you're optimizing for. But Choosing gamma, like in, in a you know in a real real scenario where you would get, you would have you know some problem and you don't know what should be your gamma. That's uh, not so obvious what you should do, and that's that's a problem that came I think that came into like the the, the interest in in the reinforcement learning community a bit late. David Silver has work on this, like what's the role of gamma? How do we choose gamma? Can we like meta learn it? Um, there, there's, there are works out there, but it's, um, yeah, the gamma is really like your, your parameter and you keep it for the entire learning. I think it would be, you know, it would be also interesting to explore I, like kind of situations where somehow at the beginning you're willing to plan ahead a lot and then eventually you kind of readjust for some criterion, but I, I wouldn't know how to do this. Like, um, I think this is kind of an, an open question. Um, so we did all of this. Okay, so like I said, we're gonna start with policy evaluation. So I give you a policy, and now the question is how do you evaluate it? So we saw at the beginning of the talk that it's super easy in an MDP usually, you just count like the rewards on the way, you discard them, you discount them, and that's it, but in a real, MDP where you don't know the reward function and you don't know the transition probabilities and everything, well, on, the only thing you can do is just roll it out. Like, roll your policy in your environment and obtain a trajectory. So we always assume that we can, we can do this, that we have a simulator, we have an environment where we can run our policy and get data. This is kind of the, you know, this is where RL, you know, that's what RL do, does, is that we can collect data and we can collect data in, in this like episodic way. You, you take your policy, you roll it in your environment, you obtain this like trajectory, it's, your, it's only one policy that did this. You obtain this like rewards on the way and all those things that you've observed. You compute the value and then you can update. For the next, for the next episode you could update if you want it or you can run another episode. And you know, it's like for now, 
what we say is we're, because we're just evaluating this policy, we're going to keep it, we're just going to run trajectories, co collect data, and then run it, run it, until we feel like we have a value that converged. Okay, so again, the value of the, the definition of the return, like if uh, this one had really kind of insisted on it. Um, okay, there are two ways, two major ways of computing a value, uh, in evaluating a policy in an MDP. The value, the, the method the number one is what is called Monte Carlo estimation, meaning I have right now like a policy that starts in S0. I can unroll it. Every time I unroll it, what I obtain is a random evaluation of this entire sum. So G, like my G here, or G of S0, is the entire you know, value from S0 all the way to the end. Then at S1, from S1 on, I can compute the discounted rewards from there, and I have, the, I have a, a, a random estimate, a random sample from this random variable here, Right, so here, here we have a random variable and the value is an expectation. So we need to compute a mean over those things, kind of. We need to eventually update, update this thing. So um, we are going to obtain samples from this entire thing for each state along the trajectory. So we unroll this trajectory and for each of the state inter in intermediate states, we compute these, these values and we update. So the, we maintain these like value estimates for this policy and for this current you know, MDP. And we update, <clears throat> we update the, at the end of this trajectory, we update the value by just um, kind of in, um, you know, here the curve, okay, we, by simply the old one plus some learning rate times the error, the error we make being the one that we just collected, we collected minus what we thought the value was. So it's a very simple, you know, update, update system, except that um, we need to collect an entire trajectory and to, and to compute the entire gain from every state until the end to obtain an estimate. So this is, these are the main problem of Monte Carlo estimation. It works and it is unbiased, so it's, it's a nice way of computing this expectation, just sampling random variables and updating the mean in a kind of a progressive way. Okay, except that like we need these complete sequences before we can update the mean. And somehow we also rely on having for sure episodic environments. So here it's not a big, uh, you know, I have assumed that we have episodic environments, so like fine, but in, in general, in reinforcement learning, you can do a lot of things also outside of episodic environment, so that would be a big constraint for you. You could not use this method. Okay, so people were like, mm, maybe a Monte Carlo estimation, not so efficient. Let's do something else. Let's use what they called, or Rich Sutton called, temporal difference learning. So temporal difference learning is saying that like, Actually, on this trajectory, you can cut it in, sm in pieces because, because it's a Markov process. So on the way, you have state, actions, reward, and next state. Okay? And at every, time, at every time t, every step t in your, in your uh, trajectory and in your learning process, you have an estimate of the value. And you're going to update it by its current value plus the learning rate times the error. Again, you're kind of this gradient. It's like a gradient uh, ascent kind of uh, argument, except that TD is not the gradient of anything. It's like people keep repeating this. It's very, it's very important. TD is not the gradient of anything. But it's still like this gradient kind of uh, idea that, that you can have in the back of your head. What we do here is we're going to say, what is the current value that I believe in? It's the Bellman value. It's reward plus gamma times the value of the next state that I currently have stored in my dynamic programming, in my, you know, in, in, in my system. So this R plus gamma V is kind of this estimate of the Bellman, current Bellman value of my policy, minus what I believe so far was the value of the state. So for every state, action, reward, next state, I have an update of the value of the policy 
just using this kind of Bellman thing. This new update is biased. It's biased because this thing doesn't really estimate the true value, right? As opposed to the gain that we had before, this gain here is the true value of the state. It estimates the true value of the state. Here, no. It's like your current estimate and it's biased. But you have a much lower variance because you don't accumulate all the random rewards on all the rest of the trajectory. You kind of stabilize your estimator by only taking the local estimate what's going on at this state, in this area of the, of the MDP, if you will. So this idea has been pretty successful and is going to be quite you know, at the heart of a lot of things that we are going to see afterwards. And I think I wanted to give an intuition of the difference between those two things. Yeah, maybe I have time. I, I have until like 10.15, right? Yeah, OK. Should be good. OK, so I, again, made some computations for you. So we take this like grid world that we had, uh, that we had earlier. And um, so the question is going to be to, calc to compute the value of this state using this Monte Carlo estimation. So typically, like at the beginning, all the estimates are 0. You know, like we don't know. So that's, it, that's our policy. That's the policy I fixed. So my policy always does this. So every time I run my policy, it goes up and right. And it collects a reward of 1. So it's super easy. The g of st is 1 every time. Except that, no, it's not 1 every time. It's the g of st here is 1. This is the, uh, the reward you get. But the g of st here is 0 plus gamma times 1. So it's gamma. Then the g of st here is 0 plus gamma plus gamma square times 1. So it's gamma square. OK? All right. And now um, I want to get, get to the next step. So now I have my estimates, right, uh, whatever they were, uh, 0 0.576 and 0 0.9. So these are the two things. And it seems like I've already spoil the answer. I oh, know this, this was the intermediate ones that I didn't write because I didn't have space. <laughs> okay, so like this is like the current estimate that we have of the value of these states. And now we run another trajectory and we observe another one here and we're going to update all the states on the trajectory. So once we have a trajectory, we can make an update of all the states, but this update is really going to take like the, the whole reward, you know, we wait and then we take the one all the way to the end. So then what we get is like, well, this guy is going to get 0 0.9 plus whatever is alpha, alpha times the difference, 1 minus what I thought the state was, 1 minus 0 0.1, this is minus 0 0.9, this is 0 0.1, so 0 0.99. So we're, we're getting really close to 1 immediately, right? And the, the question is, what would be the value here? So the value here, we're going to just apply this formula. So I think I have written it. Value here is previous value plus alpha times gamma times 1. So gamma minus the current value. And this gives, gives me already like a pretty good, pretty good estimate. You know, we are very close to 0 0.8 already. So in one iteration in two iterations in this very simple MDP, we get super close like values to the, to the policy. So it's a fairly efficient kind of system, but I need to generate an entire trajectory before I can update all the states. And on the other hand, temporal difference. Um, so temporal difference, you know, simil similar. We, um, I rewrote all the things. Um, so here, you know, every time I make a step in this MDP, I update. So I'm here. I'm going to update the value here. It's going to be updated by zero because nothing happens. Then I move here. I update the value of here. And it's going to be updated by zero because nothing happens. This zero, this zero, zero. And then, so this, all these states here, they all get zero. So that's what I wrote here. Except this guy. This guy gets zero plus alpha times what I thought minus the true value. And then, like, you know, this is the, the, this, this equation here. It gives me 0 0.9. So now after one trajectory, I have already one state that has been updated. And now I restart. And at, at the end, when I arrive at this state and I transition to this state, I can already update its value. 
So you're going to tell me, yeah, it's great, but like in your previous example, we were updating the entire states on the way. And you're right. In like a short, episodic environment, like the one I presented before, do Monte Carlo for sure. But you can see that like if you had a very big environment and you had intermediate rewards, like on the way you could like collect, I don't know, apples, and then in the end you have to get out of the thing, like TD suddenly makes a lot more sense. Because every time you make a step in the MDP, you, you update your value, and so you can progressively update your policy as you go, in a way. You don't do it because uh, you, need, you need to wait for the end of the episode, but like, you, know, you update the value on the go, and you can, you can, make, uh, you can have better, better estimates of, uh, of the value of the policy on the, on the trajectory. And this is exactly the idea that is exploited by Sarsa, so SARSA is this old algorithm, but that's still, I think, fairly relevant. Um, that's like, um, or at least, you know, yeah, I mean, I don't know how relevant it is, but I think it's a, I think it's a good illustration of, um, of like how to use TD learning on, on policy in an MDP. So it's exactly what we just did, but now we're going to use these like iterations, these, these uh, TD learning iterations, to learn a better policy on the way, like as we repeat episodes. So I introduced this new thing, so this little like orange box here, um, introduces this notion of epsilon greedy policy. Um, epsilon greedy is what we do in reinforcement learning or what a lot of people do in reinforcement learning to do exploration. Um, when you have a value, like we said, when you have a value of a state, a Q value in a state, well, like we said, this guides your policy. You want to follow this Q value. But if you only follow your Q value, you never explore. You never explore what you could have got if you were to go to the other side of the MDP. And this is important. If you don't collect this data, you'll never get to observe what, what you could have had in the, on the other hand of the MDP. And so, you know, you, you, you kind of feel that like you can't get accurate estimates of a value if you don't have samples, right? So that's how... We, that's why we introduce epsilon greedy. But yeah, so um, we're going to use this epsilon greedy policy to act in our environment. And what the only thing we want to do now is update our Q function to update our policy and get a better and better policy in the same way as we did value iteration before, except that now we cannot compute the exact value updates. Value, we, we have to sample it from the, from the, the trajectory. OK, so um, for each episode, we're going to sample this state action, reward, state, and action. So next action, the, the, hence the name of the algorithm. We start in a state S. We, get, we take an action from epsilon greedy. We get a reward. And then we observe the next state. And in this next state, we ask our policy what would be the action you would take? So we ask this policy what, what action they would take, and we, we use this action here to, to compute the update. So the Q function gets updated by the usual like TD learning updates that here estimates you know, the discounted value of, of the current like, state minus what we thought it was. OK. So if you iterate this, it's been, it's been proved that there are convergence results of these things as long as you cover the state fairly well, so as long as you have an epsilon in your epsilon greedy. So this is just applying the value iteration algorithm or the TD learning updates um, to, to obtain the, the value of the, in the MDP. So, I mean, there is a, I guess, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah, so this is kind of what happens when you run it. Um, as you see, like the, the values, they start updating from the, from the end, right? At the beginning, you only get updates from where the rewards are. And as you run episodes, these updates, they propagate. And because you're doing epsilon greedy, sometimes you take this other path, but not so often. The values on the main path that you initialize are kind of more often uh, updated. But eventually, you know, you also get estimates on the, on the other path that like what, what you should do. And, you know, this is just 100 iterations, but you already get a fairly, you know, good idea, you know, in every state, you have a fairly good idea of what you should do, right? So 100 iteration, you already know everywhere what should be your, 
your, your best policy. Okay, um, so with like this is kind of I would consider you know the the the, the most the most basic but kind of uh, um, necessary knowledge about reinforcement learning. We work with Markov decision processing processes, and the first problem, the first challenge, is to compute optimal policies. And once we know how to do it in a Markov decision process, when we know everything, we can ask the question of how would we know, how would we do if we would actually not know these, these, these models? And then we compute, we, we sample trajectories and by kind of smart updates of our estimates, we compute two values and we, we end up with like the, the, the optimal policies. Okay, um, the question is like, can we do better than SARSA and um, what if the, the state's action space, state action space would be, for example, very large or structured or infinite, typically? So this is like kind of what, what has been achieved over the past, uh, the past few years. Um, I actually, I'm not sure how much time I had for this, uh, this intermezzo, so maybe, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, maybe I'll keep it for the end. Okay. We're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna just stop for a second just to get questions maybe. Um, and we, I'll keep the little, the little intermediate break for the end. No questions? No questions. Okay. You have a question? Yes, the audience is here. Did anyone actually use Sarsa ever? What, so I'm guessing that like people use here if you, okay, maybe, maybe one here. Like maybe some people here use more Q learning yeah, or policy gradients. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think the reason why I presented Sarsa is because it's so similar to Q learning, but not quite. Was it clear for all of you who know Q learning? Was it clear for you what's the difference with Q learning? Like, do you know like how Q learning is different from this? I see yes. So what what how what's the big difference with Q learning? So what so what of policy means? I haven't said so much what is the on policy part on this slide. So like maybe like what's what's off policy? What's on policy and what's off policy? As far as I remember, with Q learning, it's updated based on the best value, not on the value that we got on this specific uh, run. Yes, exactly. So I'm going to repeat that. So what is very important here in Sarsa, and what was the, the it was the original idea that people had, is that okay, if you want to know in which state you end up next and what is the value of this next state, you need to get a Q value. And what, is Q, the Q, what Q value do you want to put here? You want to put the Q value of a next action that you policy, your policy would take. So you have to sample from your policy the next action A prime. That's why we call it on policy. We say, we ask the policy to generate what would be the next action. Whereas in, in Q learning, it's off policy. And it's off policy in the sense that this action here, why do you need, why do you need it to be? the action of your own policy. It could be just the best action or your current belief of what the best action is, typically. So you would kind of more immediately, like more directly take what is like the optimal the decision here and update this value with something that's like, is a little bit biased towards the optimal policy in a way. And this is the idea that was proposed in uh, the end, at the end of the, the 80s, I think it, 1989 or something, by um, Chris Watkins and Peter Diane. And um, that kind of completely, you know, even if it's a small modification of the algorithm, it really com com completely changes uh, the, the, so we, we just said all of this, completely changes how we, how we construct the algorithm. And it will allow us to leverage 
either like other logged data and do all sorts of leverage supervised learning. So this is the this is really the the, the, the thing that's at the heart of of Q learning and that really differs from from this naive maybe idea of SARSA, which was to just use your own policy to only like never never bootstrap from something else. Always use your only your own policy. But why not? You know why why not bootstrapping from something something else? Okay, so Q learning. We just we just said it. You know without without the images, but like essentially Q learning is the same as SARSA. You start you you're going to run this epsilon greedy policy. Start from some some star, uh, some some states, and then from this epsilon greedy policy, take an action, observe a reward, observe a next state, and in this next state, you update the you update the value with the best action. What what you believe for now is the greedy best action in this next state. And well, a priori, this is kind of what another policy would do, not yours. Yours is epsilon greedy, right? But like another policy would do. But in general, it could be any other policy. Is this like off policy idea? Is this, this update here? You could kind of use something else. And this is what deep reinforcement learning is, is going to leverage eventually. I have a couple of slides afterwards. But like what you put here for your TD update can be something that you decide, you stabilize, you design with with previous data. And this is going to help with, you know, with learning. Okay, so we just, we just went over this. The, the only difference between, between Q, SARSA and Q-learning is what you put in here in, in, the, in the update of the, of the Q-learning, Q great. So function approximation, why is it important? Why, why is this off-policy learning giving you this new power to kind of leverage some, some other knowledge or some other things that you could do. So typically, I'm going to, you know, for the sake of making simple slides, I'm going to imagine that this function approximation is a linear function. But in all generality, you can always assume that there is a, a parameterized function, so a typically a neural network, that approximates this Q function. So in every state and action, you have a function that approximates the value of the or, 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 yeah, the, the Q function, and here it's going to be this, this linear thing. And the goal now, instead of directly estimating a Q, an Q of S and A entry, is going to be to estimate the weights, the weights of this neural network that approximate, that is supposed to approximate your policy. So you want to do this like least square, least square minimization, where you try to minimize the error between what is the true value of your policy that you're going to need, need to use data to like sample trajectories as we just saw, right? And what is the current estimate that you like, maintain by, by, by estimating these weights? So the nice thing with least square is that like, that gives us a very nice gradient. So we can compute the gradient uh, with, uh, with these like, linear functions. So linear functions, it always makes things look nicer, but like, you could a priori just do the same and compute the gradient as well for your neural network, as long as everything's differentiable and nice. So um, here I, I look, I estimate what is the, what, uh, compute what is the, the true gradient. So the true gradient is the expectation of like, the feature vector times the error between the true value and the estimated value. And what you want to do is update, um, like update the weights towards like this kind of gradient, like using this gradient. But you're going to need to estimate this because we don't know what is this Q pi of S and A. Um, so to estimate this, this is where we use the TD update or the TD evaluation. The TD evaluation is going to say you're going to generate the trajectory, right? So that's that's still allowed. You can compute like for each state, you can compute actions and generate this trajectory. But in this trajectory, you, at every state and action, you're going to estimate this Q pi using the reward plus gamma times the maximum of the current estimate that you have for the Q function. The trick is, and this is kind of what 
I mean, I, for one, I understand this is what really made this whole deep RL work. One of the things that made it work, even if, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I think, I, I don't think, I don't know how much we have like a strong understanding of how this works, but like the trick is to use a different set of weights for this estimate here that you bootstrap from for your TD update and the weights that you actually, you know, use in this other, you know, the kind of the old, the old estimate that you're, that you're using, that you're bootstrapping from, like I said bootstrapping twice. But like this, this, like these weights here are called target weights and they typically would say, they would stay quite stable. You would use all weights or you would only update these things every other, every, I don't know how many episodes, like this is kind of your own cooking and how you, when you code up these, these things, how you, you decide to do it, but it's very important to stabilize your TD update, your, your TD estimate, to, to stabilize your gradient estimation in, the, in, in the, the, the update of the weights. But you see here, you kind of leverage the fact that you're off policy and you have the right to put not anything here, like anything would be, you know, I, I wouldn't have a result of convergence for anything whereas there is a result of convergence for exactly the max of the Q function, right? This is the, this is the whole thing. But like in deep Q learning, we're not really fundamentally interested in like convergence results. We're interested in seeing how, how to make an algorithm that, that really works. And here, like this, is, this was, the, this was the, strategy, the, the strategy that people used and that eventually made things work. Leveraging a Q function that is of like another different policy, not exactly the, the maximum of the one you're following. Okay, so um, as we said, Q-learning is an off-policy algorithm and it kind of leverages, um, like, it can leverage other types of estimates. You can plug, plug in, like, in this, uh, this part of the update, kind of other things. So that's the magic of, of Q-learning. Um, and it's based on... Um, it's, it's based on this like value iteration kind of process, right? I try to compute the value and I infer the policy from it. And the, the next question I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna cover before, you know, before we finish is uh, the question of um, policy iteration and how we can do like this evaluation and then policy improvement step in uh, when, we, when we directly optimize policies. Okay. Are there questions on Q learning or anything that's yes over there? Yeah, one question to the selection of this other policy. So if I speak like a physicist, you would choose it to cover the whole face space or like to have a good um, yeah, good cover of the face space. Is there any techniques to do something like that in the realm of reinforcement learning? So I didn't understand the, which space? The phase space. So the, the phase space in physics, you know, it's the um, set of possible states that a physical system can attain. And I thought that it's kind of analogous of what you do here, right? You want to have the uh, variety in the states of um, I see. So actions. A system where you wouldn't be entirely sure which state you're in? Or is that like that, like that you have several potential states where you could be? Yeah, normally you start with an initial state and then the dynamics of your physical equation that uh, describe the model of the process you are watching describes you how the tra trajectory of the state will um, evolve through the phase space. Okay, and so you have these equations that describe how you're going to, like, how this trajectory is going to... and. So you can already predict it, kind of. Like, if you're in a certain state, you have equations that would allow you to predict where you go afterwards ideally yes and what you usually want to do is like to cover a broad range of the phase space so that you have a broad cover of the physical model of the states you are like observing in an experiment or something like that yeah ah, so okay i so this might be if i understand the question correctly it might be related to to what is called model based reinforcement learning so where you know you, here i in, no, in nowhere in these algorithms, I try to estimate the, the model or to have a good way of predicting where my 
my agent is going to go next or where what is the, the, the next the next steps of the trajectory i don't have i mean i i'm not even trying to um to get this model and this is something that people have you know they're essentially the devised reinforcement learning in two kind of paradigms this is what we call model free reinforcement learning just go with trajectories you don't know what is this system who knows and estimate value functions. But then there is a whole other kind of uh, way of looking at the problem that is like, okay, this is, this is actually a real system. This, is, this has like dynamics that I, can, that I could estimate. And as I observe my, whatever your agent, doing trajectories in the system, I can estimate the model and I can start predicting what is gonna happen and maybe use these predictions to guide my system. And that is, one of the solution, or maybe one, asp one way to go to our solutions for a better exploration. And I think you're gonna be told more about this in the next couple of hours. Um, but essentially, here you see my exploration is completely naive because I don't know anything about this system. I can only, when I wanna explore, I can only say, you know, with probability epsilon, I'm just gonna do something completely random. But if you start having a notion of how your system works, and how you know how you you're, you could guide it or where or predict where you're gonna go, then it becomes a little bit more natural to say, oh, then maybe I should go this way or I should go that way. I should try this because I could imagine that my system goes like this. I don't know if like that entirely uh, like answers your problem, but like when I answers your question, but I uh, does it? Um, yeah, I think quite so. <laughs> Um, so in physics, what you want to do is you not want to get stuck in a certain region of the phase space because that re would mean you uh, could not cover with your model the observation you made. And probably from what you explained now, you do it just with statistics to get ah. a variety or so you if you don't have an the question is the, like kind of the initialization like how like in physics you don't want to be you don't want to be initialized in some some parts of the state space or get stuck there so that you miss some part of the dynamics of the system. So yeah. you want to have a like cover of everything that could potentially happen so that you have a whole description of your dynamical system. Uh -huh. And so I was wondering how you can bring the variety into your <laughs> reinforcement yeah, learning. Yeah, that's like, that's the question in reinforcement learning. It's like, at least from my perspective, right now we don't yet have a very good understanding of exploration, meaning like how to Di diversely explore the space in a way that covers well the diversity of the state space. Okay, in like if you have a grid world like this one, sure, you know, you can compute in every state like how many times you visited and stuff, but like if you're in a very large system and maybe some states are like, maybe with like some geometry that's complex, how do you really cover the state space? This is just a super hard question. And in deep reinforcement learning, it poses all sorts of, of, of problems and um, you know, I'm far from having all the answers to this to this question because it's really a, an open one that a lot of people are trying to address in different ways. And I think, Theo, you're going to talk a little bit about this from what I understood. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, you're going to have a little bit more about this. But, yeah, this is like a super on-point question. Okay. Last stretch, policy gradient. Bear with me for another five minutes. It's gonna be relatively quick because I gave up on doing all the proofs. Um, it was hard, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I mean, so there is, a, there is, policy gradient is this like super interesting um, kind of paradigm of algorithms that somehow was much less explored and I don't know, I think there was a phase where all of reinforcement learning was essentially Q-learning and now like most, it's kind of re-switching to like uh, switching to this. And, and, um, and a lot of people start, um, like people that had a background in optimization start being interested in those methods because we, it's a non-convex problem of optimizing policies, parameterized policies. And there is interesting theory to do also on like convergence of these methods. So, um, okay, what are we talking about? We are gonna assume that we have a policy that is parametrized. So that is directly the policy that's parametrized. It's not the value function. We assume that the policy obeys some, you know, representation of the state space and some parameter theta. 
So typically, you can think of it as like, it's a soft max. You know, in, if it's a nice grid world, you have for each state on action, you have a parameter theta. And what your policy does is it, uh, it, takes a policy, it takes an action according to this probability softmax probability distribution. Or it's a neural softmax. There is a neural network that kind of embeds the state action space, and you take the softmax of this neural representation. That's ways to parameterize your, your, your policy. And then um, we still want to optimize this value here in expectation over the, the first states. So maybe that's also like a point that I had not highlighted too much, but often we assume that we have an initializing measure and we always take expectations over this initializing measure. So it's a fixed thing. Every time we restart our environment, we restart in a state that's sampled from mu and mu is fixed. And mu is often a Dirac in a state. Okay. And now we have a function that is a function of pi of theta. So it's just a function of theta. So we can optimize it. We can try to directly optimize this function of theta. Right? The theta is hidden in here because a of t is a function of theta in every state. And we're going to you know, collect trajectories with the goal no longer to, 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 estimate the, the, the police, no, to estimate the value as we did before, but to estimate the gradient of this function at the current theta, right? The one thing we need to do this gradient descent is this gradient here. Now you're gonna tell me, wait, you just said it's non-convex, why are you doing gradient descent? Because, because like there is not so much else that you can do, like that you can try. There are other things that you can try to like, you know, try to leave the, the local optima and things. And this is kind of an, again, an open, research questions, and I'm sure there are like experts in the room, like better experts in the room than, than me on this topic. But like for now, we're going to assume that provided some initialization, maybe some noise, some, some something, we are gonna assume that stochastic gradient is, is an okay algorithm to reach some at least local minima of this function. Okay, so how do we compute the gradient of a gain function, of a, of a function that, is, looks, that looks like this, where theta appears in every single action and every single next state depends on my previous action, right? We have a long, complex, random sequence that all depends on theta. So how do we compute a gradient for this? So we're going to use a very smart trick. I don't know if people call it like the policy gradient trick or it's like just the policy gradient theorem but it's this like log trick. So look at it, it's, uh, it's, it just happens in like two lines. We're going to say that this gradient of the policy at state action, at this state action pair is, we multiply and divide by the policy itself, the value of the policy itself. And then we notice that this thing, this gradient over pi is the gradient of the log of the policy. So now we can say that just to compute this gradient here, we can have this like pi times the gradient of the log. Why is this useful? Well, because we're taking, you know, generally like expectations over this type of, you know, over what pi is doing. So it's going to really nicely rewrite my, the gradient of the policy as an expectation of the total reward of this trajectory, so remind, remember, we, we generated a trajectory, so we have state actions, state action reward, state action reward, like this for like an infinite sequence. So we can compute this R of T, it's this thing, right? The return, the total return. And then for every step in the trajectory, we compute this gradient of pi as like the, sorry, wait, what did I do? I think it's the log here. Yeah, that, that's, that's a big mistake. The gradient of the log here, right? Okay, so um, this, obviously we don't have the expectation of it, but it's okay to just have a stochastic estimate of this gradient using um, the, you know, just the trajectory that we have and the one step of gradient descent. 
And this is what people have been doing. And the power of these methods is this like scalability and generalizability to almost any function approximation that you can think of and for which you can easily compute log gradients. Here, if you compute the log here and you compute the gradient, you end up with just the gradient of this thing. So it's, it's, you directly play with the gradient of the function approximation. So this is, this is why this type of method has been like um, uh, really, really successful and really interesting and even from a theoretical point of view, like has a lot of uh, you know, open problems and super interesting questions to, to be working on. Okay, so um, you know this is for this is all for reinforcement learning. I'm exactly on time, so I will not take too long for for the rest of you know this. Uh, I I just want to say that like this is this like I said this is like just a friendly tasting of what what are the different aspects of reinforcement learning. So there are so many things out there like between model free, model based, on policy, and off policy. Um, I tried to give you like some some initial uh, understanding of, of what's what's going on and uh, and how these these algorithms work and how we deal with these dynamical systems where we don't know the, the dynamics actually. One thing we've mentioned a little bit through the question is this uh, this like exploration. We've we've relied on epsilon greedy and like I said, it's probably not the best thing to do. But to do better. You kind of need to be able to direct this exploration. How do you direct exploration? You need to kind of tell your algorithm, hey, over there I know already what's going on. Don't go there. Over there I don't know. And there might be rewards. There, I, have some, I have some measure of uncertainty that tells me that you know, I don't know enough to discard this path. So let's go there. And it's like uncertainty quantifi quantification guiding exploration is has seen like a lot of progress over, let's say, the past 10 years, but it's still like a very important open problem. Um, and you know, how to combine them with perhaps model-free algorithms, so not, not necessarily using the entire model. All these questions are, are, are really important. Um, I've mentioned com like this, like convergence guarantees. We have convergence guarantees for a lot of the RL algorithms I've, I've told you about, but non-deep, right? Like all the nice linear or tabular settings, we have convergence results, but they are, for most of them, asymptotic convergence results. Meaning if you run this thing for like ever, and we are talking millions and millions of iterations, eventually you can prove that you end up in the right, you have the right optimal policy. But non-asymptotic results, effic efficiency of these policies, how many iterations, how many samples, how many episodes do you need to actually identify the best policy? And with high probability or in expectation, all these like important questions in theory are kind of, we're only scratching the surface. We have initial results, like the, the, the actual non-asymptotic analysis of Q learning came out in 2018, right? And this is just the first result. So I think there is just a lot of super interesting question in RL theory. So, I mean, this is what I work on, but just to say, like, there's, there's a very important community working on RL theory and trying to understand how these algorithms works and how we can, we can make them more sample efficient. This is like, how can we make RL not just a big, like, large simulator kind of, kind of tool, but something where that we can work with, with like smart algorithm that could be used for applications such as drug discovery and, you know, pl places where you can't, just simulate forever, you know, things like, um, like with, with compute, like problems where there is like uh, collecting the, the, the samples, the trajectories are, is actually hard. And with this, I think I will just conclude. Thank you so much for your attention and your questions.